two, three. No, that's like barely. You got to be right up in it. Okay, sorry, Jim. So you have to be right up in it. adjusted we'll be ready to go okay all right I think that's better can everyone hear me yes. great if you could all please come in grab a seat really anywhere that you want to I was an elementary special ed teacher in another life so I don't want to go there <laughs> all right um, welcome everyone really appreciate as we really start this endeavor with the city of Lewis, that so many residents came out for our initial workshop and meeting. Okay, so welcome to the LPC Tree Subcommittee Workshop. I'm Deborah Ewald. I'm the member of the Lewis Planning Commission um, and the chair of the Lewis Tree Subcommittee. I will try to be brief and concise today and stick to my notes in front of me. For those of you who know me, you'll know that that is a challenge, uh, but there will be no comedy show today. Um, first, I want to share some background on the subcommittee, um, you know, what we've been working on, who our members are and what they've been doing, and kind of what we've pulled out of our research that we think is important. Then I'm going to introduce our speaker today, Jim White. And last, we're gonna seek the input of all of you. Um, I wanna make it really clear that what we've been doing is preliminary research. Despite the buzz, this is not you know, a draft for a tree ordinance. These are areas of focus that we think we should explore more. And we really wanna hear from you too, because we know in the city of Lewis there is a wealth of human resource and there are probably people in this room who are far better versed on this topic than I am. Um, so just to give you a little background, you know, for years people have been talking about protecting trees in Lewis. And in 2022, the LPC decided to act on this topic. And many requests, many mem uh, residents have brought it up over the years and have asked questions, how can those trees be removed? Um, where's, why, don't, why isn't there any regulations for this? Um, and we had our first meeting on 7-7-22, and I hope that was an auspicious date. <laughs> uh, and we have met regularly since then to explore research and discuss possible actions that the city of Lewis could take to conserve and protect our trees. Um, I want to thank the members of the tree committee who've put in many long hours in meetings and out of meetings, more hours, researching. Um, Joe Hockner and Richard Ennis of the LPC, Mary Linda Maddy, and if you all want to give a wave if you're here, uh, and Marty Thompson, who's also tree commissioner for Parks and Rec, um, have been with us from the beginning. Rick Spitzborg has joined us later, and recently Melanie Moser from the LPC joined us to replace Joe, who is sadly retiring from the LPC after 10 long years. So we're not letting him, I'm not sure, is Joe here? He, I'm sure he's with us on Zoom. We will not be letting him off that easy. <laughs> he's already uh, continued to attend meetings, and I, I know Joe, he will be using his due diligence and giving us his expertise, um, input, and wisdom. Uh, but no candy if he's virtual. He's known for that. Okay. Serving as the chair of this subcommittee has been a very humbling experience for me. I, my background, just as a citizen, just like every one of you, is more in the areas of you know, working for change and improvement uh, through the government, through social action, through community activism, and I have learned a lot from the members of this tree subcommittee, and I thank all of you. This is a far more complex topic than the Lorics encountered. It's not about just don't cut down the trees. There are so many, there's so much minutia here. 
Um, there are many factors and so much minutia that when it came to exploring tree protection and tree ordinances. I am not an arborist and I'm glad that we have members who have great depth of knowledge here. And again, we continue to welcome the wealth of knowledge in the community. We're looking for novel ideas and we hope that today will be a start with you providing them. If we were you know, looking for a big idea to grab onto and the big idea is protecting and growing the Lewis tree canopy. This is kind of a universal idea of mm, people aren't arguing that there's anything wrong with the tree canopy. But not everyone really knows exactly what the tree canopy is or what the benefits of the tree canopy are. So we're going to be learning a lot about that today. Um, it is incredibly important to preservation and the quality of life. It's measurable and it's already an existing goal for the city of Lewis. The city of Lewis adopted a resolution to increase the tree canopy from 34 to 38% based on the latest Arbor scan measurement, which unfortunately was done back in 2014. And we know that that's eight years, a lot has changed. Um, by the Delaware Forest Service under the Delaware Department of Agriculture. We are already in the process of asking and asking when is this gonna be done again? And that has to be part of this um, endeavor. So what is a tree canopy and why is, is it so important to protect it? This is a lot of what Jim's gonna be talking to, but I will briefly just say, there are a lot of long de definitions for tree canopies. Um, some of them include shrubs, some don't. The simplest way, and for me, I read many of them, here's how I synthesize it. You know, pretend that you are a Wonder Woman flying up above and you look down and it's everything that's green that is covering um, the ground or structures beneath. And there are many, uh, you know, the role of the benefits of the tree canopy, Jim will be discussing in detail, but it's widely acknowledged that tree canopies have the following benefits. They remove pollutants from the air, soil, and water. Um, they have great benefits and efficiency benefits too in shading homes and cooling, um, cooling through the release of water vapor, uh, interception of rainfall and reduction of stormwater runoff, and thus reducing the costs related to infrastructure required to manage it. Manage it. And more important for the city of Lewis even is um, helping us keep that water back and we all need to be worrying about that. I will just say as a personal note, I bought a house here in the early 2000s and I wasn't in a flood zone. And I am now, and I'm not on the beach. So it's something to consider. Um, also benefits are energy savings and reduced greenhouse gas emissions due to the shading that's involved. Increased property values. And there are many other health social, economic, and aesthetic benefits as well. Uh, trees, it's even been proven that especially trees make people happy. So that's a good thing. And so why do we need to protect trees now? As Lewis grows, we're seeing more development, expansion, redevelopment of existing properties, and replacement of existing homes with larger homes, both of, all, both of which uh, result in a loss of trees. We have also heard from citizens for years that they want protection for our city's heritage and specimen trees. I think we all know the perfect example is, of course, the bride and groom. And people always worry about the bride and groom, but they're the bride and groom. We all love them. Um, but that's only one example. There are many trees like that in our community, and we're blessed by those. Um, some of them are now well-known landmarks in Lewis. And people are also concerned when large trees or many trees are removed from their neighborhoods. Many people are surprised about that the mass removal of trees or removal of large healthy trees is even permitted in Lewis. When a big tree comes down, the first thing somebody says is, how can that happen? Isn't that in the zoning code? Well, it isn't. We do have an existing code for city trees and that is chapter 177. We explored that in depth um, and that just, that covers all park trees, street trees, and trees on public lands. So if you've seen those street trees with badges on them with little plaques, those are the street trees. Um, 
However, chapter 177 does not address any trees that are not on city land. And at the present time, we do not have any other tree regulations. Our subcommittee believes a tree ordinance for the city of Lewis would support parks and recreation in meeting the goal of expanding the tree canopy to 38% or surpassing it. And that really is our hope. Um, through the implementation of a tree ordinance with a multi-prong approach. And it's also, you know, trees have a life, and I've learned a lot about trees. Um, Marty Thompson does kind of oversee Chapter 177 in the city trees, and they have, you know, they have a plan in place to grow that part of the canopy, but, you know, that's only one part of the city, and the larger part of the city is the rest of the land that all of you and myself own. Um, so a multi-prong approach, what we're looking at as possible components are at these tables here today. Um, a program that identifies and preserves our remarkable historic trees, uh, preserves specific mature trees on private property, increases public education regarding the value of planting trees and correct planting and care, creates a tree planting requirement for properties being redeveloped and creates protections for existing trees on construction sites. We're not here to present an ordinance and no decisions have been made. This is a preliminary step to hear from our community and that's critical in the development of any tree ordinance. We have brought our ideas uh, to the mayor and city council and you know, they've tasked us with continuing on this exploration. There is another special need for a tree ordinance in Lewis and frankly, any town in Sussex County. A few of them have addressed it, many have not. Um, I think we should be looking aspirationally, not at what other communities have done. Uh, Lewis has always been a leader, and I think we need to be a, continue to be a leader on this subject. Um, we discovered during our research that other jurisdictions in our region have more state and county protections for trees and buffers than Delaware or Sussex County do, which makes local ordinances less needed in other areas, for example, Maryland. Um, Maryland has protected the critical areas since 1986, which are generally defined as all land and water areas within 1,000 feet beyond the landward boundaries of tidal wetlands, the bay and its tributaries. All development and land disturbing activities within the critical area are guided by specific provisions found in the state adopted critical area criteria and the local critical area programs. These provisions cover issues from clearing trees and removing vegetation to limiting areas of impervious surface. This state legislation provides protection for trees. But other Maryland counties on Delmarva, such as Wacomico even, have created their own tree regulations. Many Maryland local jurisdictions have their own tree ordinance that regulates private trees, as there is some local discretion allowed, as long as the guiding principle of the critical area law requires no net loss of forest or developed woodland cover in the critical area. So meaning you may be able to take out some trees, but you're gonna to have to put those trees back. And maybe you're gonna to work towards the future and you're gonna take out some trees that might be at the end of their lives and replace them with some trees that are going to have benefit for the decades to come. Um, we have no such protection from our state or from our county. So the most comparable areas for us to look at are Rehoboth Beach and Henlopen Acres, which both regulate public and private trees. Henlip and Acres is relatively new. Um, they adopted their latest code in 2019. So I think that's something to consider. You know, the time is, maybe the time is, is now, maybe the time has even passed. Um, I do believe that Lewis needs to develop a code ordinance to protect our trees too. So the process was we, we examined a variety of tree ordinance from North Carolina to Maryland, mainland Maryland to New Jersey, to Pennsylvania, to ordinances here on Delmarva. Most ordinances apply to street trees only, like especially those in large urban areas. Um, or they cover both street and private trees. And that's more common in um, residential areas where there is a lot, of, lot more you know, open space and privately held land that you can plant trees on. 
Um, the codes we discussed most and delved into the deepest are linked on the Lewis Planning website. And we're also going to be adding today all of the um, boards that we have and the input so that people can, do, can participate online. So that's right on the planning website in the city of Lewis. Um, Lewis is unique as our street trees are covered by chapter 177. So we would actually need to create a separate ordinance in the zoning code that will apply only to private trees. There's no need to integrate these codes as chapter 177 for city trees is really, it's working well, it's established and it's under the parks and rec. Um, the tree ordinances subcommittee research has identified five areas we think should be included in the tree ordinance. This is a high level overview, so specific details still need to be discussed and determined. We're presenting the following areas today uh, for consideration and feedback from the City of Lewis stakeholders. And again, it's going from this direction, um, and I'll come back up at the end and give a quick direction for each. It's education and outreach to support property owners and help them select and sustain the right trees for the right place. And on this one, I actually wanna ask, um, I'll do a show of hands. If you're a city of Lewis resident, you know, stakeholder, property owner, could you raise your hand? Okay, great. Well, we mostly have city of Lewis people here, but I think this one, we can really, we can't do everything and we can't do much for what happens outside of our borders. But we can be leaders and we can provide education about best practices, the trees to use, um, offer planning workshops, and then perhaps people who are moving into new developments will make better choices about planting trees. And you know, our resources, if they're out there, they can be used beyond our borders. Uh, the next one would be tree recognition program, which we marry Linda Maddie. Um, to identify and protect our special and remarkable trees, the heritage and specimen trees of special importance in Lewis. And that will be over here, okay. We got out of order, that's all right. Um, then we will have preservation and potential regulation of existing trees on private property identified by specific criteria. I know that's the hot potato, so I'll be taking that one directly behind. After that, Rick Spitzborg um, is developing a tree planting requirement, especially for new construction applications or for renovation applications that exceed the present dimensional footprint. Um, and last, this is probably our most technical area, but um, Melanie Moser is gonna be manning the area which talks about creation of construction requirements to protect and preserve trees that are on or near excavation and or construction. And kind of the background on that is these are the trees that are left behind. Sometimes a thin strip, sometimes they are messing with the ground right up to the edge and over the roots of those trees. And what we found out was a lot of codes, um, sometimes they penalize people later. And that's really hard to track down. It also requires a lot of administration. So our idea is to set some standards right up front to protect the trees, to prevent anyone from having to chase them down later. So again, after our speaker, I'll come back with brief directions. For now, I would like to introduce our speaker, Jim White. Jim has worked as a biologist for the Delaware Nature Society since 1982, where he has directed the Delaware Nature Society's Land and Biodiversity Management Program. Jim is a native Delawarean and attended the University of Delaware. He's dedicated to the protection and management of Delaware's native species and the habitats where they live. He teaches herpetology at University of Delaware, and with his wife has published a field guide to the amphibians and reptiles of the Delaware Peninsula, Delmarva Peninsula, pardon me. He has written extensively on Delaware's biodiversity and speaks regularly on the topic. He is currently chair of the Delaware Natural Areas Advisory Council and the Delaware Native Species Commission. And also, Jim has received a lot of attention for discovering, come on out and you can help us with this, of the, of the tree, it's a... Uh, I didn't discover it personally, it was oh, land. Okay, great. Uh, the American chestnut, a very large one. Yes, real, a true um, heritage tree of Delaware. So, thank you everyone and please welcome Jim. Thank you. It's great to be down here in the south. Um, I'm a northerner. 
uh, all the way up there in Hocus in Delaware. Have you ever been that far north in this state? <laughs> uh, I live about a half a mile from the state line, but I'm a Delawarean. I'm ready to where my wife and I are ready to buy a new uh, to buy a house, and she started sh showing me houses in Maryland, and I just I I got very nervous. Um, um, I I hope never to leave. So. What I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna give you just an overview of trees. And you're here because you already know a lot about trees. So I'm just gonna kind of give a, a little slideshow or PowerPoint, whatever you call it. Um, talking a little bit about here, uh, trees in Delaware, forest in Delaware, and as far as we go. Now I have to signal my, my changes. So um, that'll be the signal, unless I decide to change it right in the middle. So um, that didn't change, did it? Maybe I have to dance or something. Okay. Um, trees and the forests that they create have always been important to humans. That's all there is to it. Um, the human species evolved with trees. We utilize them throughout our, our development. We use them for everything, for building, for heating, you name it, for food. We found our food there. So they're very important. We're all very used to trees. We all, I haven't met a person who doesn't like trees. Um, but probably some of us like them more than others. Um, so I'm gonna, trees have always been a huge part of this country. This is a map of the United States, obviously, showing, um, what's, what's the date, Eight, 1620. This is prior to most European uh, arrival here in the United States, and the black is forest. So it was a forest country up to the Mississippi River, and then in the Northeast. So forest has always been very important here. So when the first Europeans arrived, they got off their boats and went, holy mackerel, because they weren't used to all these trees. Europe had already cut down theirs a long time before. So the first thing they did is cut down the trees. And they had to. They had to. They needed trees for everything that they were to, to sustain themselves. That was all there was to it. They needed trees for, again, housing, for heat, and they had to clear trees so that they could grow food for themselves. So virtually, um, these folks, I assume most men, but not necessarily, were out there with, with regular manual axes and saws, and they cut down virtually every tree in the eastern United States. There are almost no native virgin trees in the United States today. How they did this, I have no idea. I have no idea how they piled them up that high in this photograph. But uh, uh, um, humans are very uh, um, driven, is a very driven species, almost everything we do. So this is another map, and this is 1850. So by 1850, you notice trees are growing back. They're growing back, especially in the mountains, because those settlers realized that those areas were not good places to grow food. So they pulled back and they started to only cultivate land that was paying. Also, agricultural practices were changing. They could be more efficient. So the trees were actually starting to grow back. And then this is um, 1926. It reversed again. And you see very few trees. By the end of the, or the 1930s, there were virtually no trees in the eastern United States. And when I say no trees, I don't mean that literally. But if you look at old photographs from the turn of the century, landscape photographs, there are almost all treeless landscapes. They had cut all these trees down again for food, for growing crops. It's amazing. So, and then, what? This is what the landscape, this is just a painting, but this is what the landscape looked like. Not here in Lewis, because it's too hilly. But it was cleared. That's all there's to it. And the trees were, you know, there are articles in papers in Philadelphia of how, how rare firewood was getting. And they couldn't get it anywhere near here. They had to get it up from Canada. It was a very uh, interesting time. So by the, the 1930s, and some of us had parents that lived in the 1930s, it was a treeless environment, except in certain, you know, mount, some mountains and things like that. This is a picture of Lewis, South Street. Now, I think this is 
looking off of route, what's now Route 1, what do you think? It, it says South Street, so it not, it's not South Street? Oh, okay. Oh, so it's mislabeled. Interesting. Or what? Maybe they renamed it? Yeah, that's probably... Because there is a South Street today, so this apparently. So said that it's... Um, we're looking at it as if we were standing in the parking lot. Um, at the beach? beach oh. It's Bayview Avenue. Okay. Off to the right. Well, that's what I thought when I looked at it. But, of course, I wasn't around then. But you, you'll notice... Oh. There's no Dairy Queen then? <laughs> so you can see very few trees in the landscape. That's the only point. That's the only photograph of Lewis in the time I could find. I'm sure there's lots more. But again, trees were, you know, virtually non existent. So then after the 1930s, and especially after the war, World War II, um, farming changed again, and trees started to grow back. In fact, what you see today, you can see forests. Uh, the main green here in Delaware, it's hard to see Delaware. when it, That's the trouble with maps. But you can see that it's mainly green down in the south in the Cypress Swamp. That's where the forests were. But the forests were starting to grow back. And today, um, the forests are actually as high as they've ever been since the 1930s in Delaware. Forest cover. That said, <laughs> go ahead. That said, oh, this is just a photograph of that, again, of, two, of the same scene back in the 1930s, or maybe this could be in turn of the century, and today. Not in Delaware, not in Delaware. I couldn't find them in Delaware. This is, obviously, we don't have those kind of hills. So, um, go ahead. Um, so today we have more forest, however, or more cover, more vegetative woody cover. However, what we're losing is older forest, mature forest. Forests that are uh, actually, um, their, their, their existing forests have probably been there for almost 80 to 90 years. So there are forests that are established, there are trees that are established, there are ecosystem in that forest that are established. We're losing that at a rate of about 16% since the 2000, year 2000. Now we're growing, there's a lot of young trees. Have anybody gone up Route 1 you know, recently? If you do it next time, look to the right and left on Route 1, especially when you get up to the new Route 1, you'll see all these young trees growing. So that's why we have more forest, is because there's so much young trees growing. But we're losing these older trees. So um, Susan covered some of this. Uh, these are the functions of a forest or functions of a tree. Um, there are cultural functions. Um, I'm not an anthropologist, so I can't tell you a whole lot about that. Other than what I've already said, humans have always needed trees for a, very, uh, a variety of reasons. There are social reasons that people need trees, and Susan touched on that too. They say they make us happier. I don't know if they do. I, I grew up in a city, and we had no trees on my whole entire block. I was pretty happy. But I was happier when I went to the park up the street with trees. I can vividly remember that. I felt like I belonged a little bit more. So that's not very scientific. But trees do, I believe, um, increase our well-being, or at least our, uh, some of us. Economical, I'm not an economist, that's for sure. Um, but there are many benefits of trees. Um, and, you know, Susan mentioned... Um, home value. Well, I think homes are all overvalued, so I don't talk about that. <laughs> I'm looking for a house. <laughs> um, but they do. They provide a lot of economical benefits, um, stormwater protection, all kinds of things that we would have to spend money on. What I'm going to talk about is ecological benefits of trees and of forest, because that's what I know a little bit about. Um, but that's not to say that this these issues you're looking at today aren't, aren't important at all. Street trees or trees in yard, I call them yard trees, but specimen trees, all these trees are important and work to, to a certain degree to help us in many different ways. Um, I just picked this one out, and this is, uh, say you have a tree in your yard, um, when it rains, these trees are really good at slowing down that water. When it hits that tree, then it just, you know, I mean, you can, 
I don't know if we do that, but I do it a lot because I have to walk my dog in all weather. And it's raining. I go under a tree, and there's less rain there than there is out. And there's really not less rain. It's just coming down slower, and it's more dispersed. And that's important. So you, if, it, if, it, if under that tree is not an impervious surface, uh, if it's grass or a, a meadow or whatever, it's going to absorb much, much better. So that water's not going to run off, run down your streets, right in the storm door, um, drains, and then into your local waterway. So that's just very one, one thing that it benefits. Now, obviously, it, you know, trees do take in pollute, air pollutants. The more trees you have, the less air pollution there is usually around. So there's a lot of benefits. But again, we're going to speak mainly on ecological. We have different kinds of forests in Delaware. From up where I'm at, we have the Piedmont Forest, which is, you know, beech, oak, hickory. Oops, sorry. Um, you get on the coastal plain. That's from Newark south down the peninsula. You get a mixed forest of, of oak, maple, um, black gum, many different types. You get also wetland forest. You get, uh, even if you go far enough south, you get cypress forests. Cypress trees, and you have, I guess, that bald cypress here. Um, we have loblolly pine forest. Now we have we have natural forests, and we have loblolly or pine plantations. They're a little different. Well, they're very different. And then if right around here, this is a taken. It um, where did I take this? I took it just Hanlope State Park at Herring Point. I just took it the other day, so I should have remembered it. I was down. I was down here on Monday, um, bird watching. Um, this is a maritime forest in the dunes. So we have a lot of different types of forests. And from those forests, you can use the trees that grow there for other reasons in your yard. And I notice, I, I love to go up, what's the first street in Lewis off the beach? Not the first, the first one you can drive, that cedar. cedar. I love driving up there because there's these little patches of habitat. I do bird counts in that area. And there, you know, especially when there's a little walkway to the beach uh, that a homeowner doesn't own it. What's that? Okay, bay. I would be bay. Okay, yeah. Um, there are these little niches of maritime forest. They're really kind of cool. And if I, I always say, if I had a house down here, that's what my yard would look like. It would look like a maritime forest. But I know that's easier said than done. Um, so there are all different kinds of forests, and you can pluck from those forests different trees to use in, in around here. And there are benefits to using these native trees, as opposed to some of the more um, trees from the Orient or from other parts of the world. I'm not saying you have to cut down those trees, don't get me wrong, but there are more benefits from native trees. So I said that we are losing mature forests, and we're losing mature forests down here. When I say down here, downstate, more than anywhere in Delaware right now, right now. Um, again, I've been coming down here for about, well, my parents had a cottage in, in Dewey, so I've been coming down here most of my life. And, and it's just amazing when you drive out west and you see what's happening to a lot of the area. So we're losing these large forests at a, at a pretty good clip down here. And it's really affecting biodiversity. This is um, another one um, where that was all forest. And it was very near some very critical habitat. I'm going to talk about that habitat in a minute. But um, there's something that's, I don't know, I don't think I have the answer to why. I, I mean, this, this was private property. Um, but the loss that occurs when you do something like that, these deforestation projects, is pretty immense. Pretty immense. Even when we try to keep the forest, it can be a little bit, it, it can damage a forest, let's put it that way. It's second best to cutting it down, I can tell you that. But these are uh, fingers or fragmentation of forest. And you may have heard of forest fragmentation. Um, when you get a nice big block of forest, it has a whole different uh, ecosystem than when you fragment into small spaces. Different animals can survive in those different places. So fragmentation is an issue uh, in many areas. Probably is always going to be, but it is. Yes. It was forest. Well, not. It was quite the other way around. It was a forest that a housing development was put in. So then, in other words, they went down and they just took lanes out. That was in Kent County. That was not in Sussex. So that, that's what that was. I just happened to have been in a helicopter and took that shot one, one Can time. Can I actually make a recommendation? If anyone's on social media, um, I follow Driscoll Drones. Oh, yeah, they have nice stuff, yeah. 
I don't know who this person is, but they are giving them, they are documenting a lot the of this. deforestation yeah. of Sussex County. Yeah. So follow them. So that, the, Facebook. Yeah. There are some other issues with trees, and I'll go through these very briefly. And um, up our way, and even down at our Abbott's Mill Nature Center, there's been a real problem. You see all these dead trees in this photo? They're ash trees. And they've been, um, every ash tree is dying. Next one. Next slide. From the emerald ash borer. And the left slide there is the, 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 well, the right slide is the little creature that does it. That's the emerald ash borer larva. And it burrows through the cambrium and under, and just takes out the whole xylem of the tree. And the trees die within a year, sometimes two. Um, this is the beetle. The beetle's just a little guy. I've never actually seen one, but yet every tree's dying in it. Yeah, they're very hard to find. But so that, that's a, a problem. I was just at our Abbott's Mill Nature Center, and every ash tree has died there. And when I say every, I'm talking about 500, maybe. And at Ashland, it was about 250. We had to change the name of Ashland to Dead Ashland. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> um, oaks, you, probably, you may have heard of the oak syndrome, oak death syndrome. Uh, many mature oaks, very old oaks, some of them 150, 175 years old, are dying. Um, it's really common up our way. And they're dying of a bunch of things. Um, two funguses that are getting them. Um, but it's, it's a combination of a lot of things. Age and all these funguses into their roots and into their uh, growing area of the trees. So we're losing a lot of these mature oaks. Um, and this is one that Susan mentioned. Anyone, what's this? Anyone know what it is? This is Assateague. Well, no, it's here. No, this is not here. It's on um, Prime Hook. Prime Hook, Fowler Beach. This is sea level rise and more frequent storms. All those white trees there are all dead. And that was from, this particular one was from Han Hurricane uh, Sandy. Was it a hurricane or a tropical storm? Hurricane? I wasn't in the country, so I didn't experience it. But anyway, um, so you'll see in sea level rise and more frequent storms uh, affecting our coastline and our forests on the coastline. So why are trees important to biodiversity? Well, um, the 40% of the birds that depend on forest in our state are declining. Um, so birds like the um, yellow-throated warbler up top to the right, the summer tanager, just under the warbler, the scarlet tanager, and then to the left, the wood thrush. So these are birds that really need big forest. And they're declining because we're chopping at these big forests, these older forests. But even our more common birds, indigo buntings, Baltimore orioles, chickadees, um, down here, the brown-headed nuthatch. You all know that bird? should it's, it's one of your claims to fame down here um, and then the, the brown creeper even our common birds rely on trees they make a living in trees now not all not all birds your great blue heron well no, I should say that they nest in trees um, there are some birds that never go in a tree some of the shore birds of course but most of our birds do rely on trees for something or other food or nesting or just resting habitat some of our most majestic birds are found in forests and woods at bald eagles, of course, as an adult and a juvenile. Uh, barred owls, red tailed hawks, I could name in the, what's that, great horned owl? Yeah, great horned owl. All these birds need forest. You probably heard of this the insect plant connection. And this is kind of the poster child for that the monarch, butterfly, and the milkweed plant. However, this plant insect connection is much bigger than that because it's all insects, almost all insects, rely on plants. And most animals rely on insects. So this is an oak tree on the left and a tulip tree on the right. That oak tree, they've done, you know, entomologists have ways to, to document how many insects are in a particular tree. And they have documented over 890 species of caterpillars, just, just moths and butterflies, in oak trees in the United States. I don't know if you ever heard of Doug Talamy. Well, Doug Talamy is University of Delaware professor and author of some great books. I'm going to mention him a little later, too. He's found, just in southeastern Pennsylvania, which is very close to me, um, 
over 500 species of caterpillars in oak tree, in one oak tree. We're talking one oak tree. So uh, the tulip doesn't have as many, but there's many species that utilize it. Here's some, the tiger swallowtail, which is the Delaware State butterfly. You should know that. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> um, uh, uses the tulip tree. Uh, many of the other moths that we really kind of love, the big wise, like the, like the cecropia in the middle and the um, luna moth on the right, also are tree moths. So the caterpillars feed on trees, different trees. And then you look at the, all the other small, I call them nondescript moths. You know, people all the time bring me things to identify. I go, hey, if I knew that, I'd be making a lot more money. But there's so many other species of moths out there, and they all feed on vegetation, many of them on trees. So insects, well, you know, you, you, you know you, if you, I don't know if you feed birds. I do. And a lot of birds come to the bird feeder, so you figure, oh, all they need is seed. All I got to do is go to Walmart. You know, no problem. But even the birds that come to your bird feeder, which aren't these guys, um, actually need trees for insects. Because almost all birds, when they are rearing their young, feed on insects. Even hummingbirds, which, you know, they feed on nectar. But during the nesting season, they, have, they need protein for their young. So they go out and catch gnats and things. So all the, almost all the birds, again, except for, I guess, shorebirds, use the trees for food for their young. So this is Doug Tallamy's study. Um, he did this on chickadees. And I'm going to have to read the numbers because I, I should have brought my glasses. Uh, anyway, this is on Carolina chickadees, which are a very common bird. And I'm sure you have them at your feeders if you have them. And um, he found that parent chickadees deliver their young, their nestlings, on average, um, one caterpillar every three minutes. So they go out. And you can watch this. If you have a bird near you, you can see uh, like a, a bluebird nest box or something. If you sat there, had a beer or a cup of coffee, it, that, they're, they're, it's amazing that where they where do they find these things? They just go out, and get one, bring them back. Because they you know they have three or four little guys in there that feed. So if um, what's that? Three hundred and fifty to five hundred and seventy caterpillars every day, and it takes eighteen days to fledge those young. So they they actually catch and feed what's it say six to nine thousand caterpillars. That's a lot for one bird. One bird. So and this white oak that he, he was studying um, was it? God, my eyes are so bad. Yeah, uh, 233 caterpillars, 15 species that the chickadees found, and black cherries had 53 caterpillars from 10 different species. So that's a statistical analysis of how important trees are. And this could be a tree in your yard. This doesn't have to be a deep forest tree. This could be an oak tree in your yard, or a cherry tree, or, or whatever. They're very valuable for wildlife. Of course, they also have fruit and seeds. And there are many birds that specialize on, on fruit and seeds. There's a persimmon, a pawpaw, holly, holly berries. Uh, I guess that's a maple. And the top one is something. I forget what it is. I don't know what that is. I think it's a birch of some sort. It's my photograph. I ought to know, huh? I got to label them. So trees provide all this in one little package. Now, of course, not only birds benefit from trees, okay? Now, maybe the tree in your yard is not going to benefit these Delaware endangered species here, but if the trees are in a forest or around wetlands, they do. And what I have here, I have uh, five endangered species in Delaware. The, the left, top left is the eastern tiger salamander. We have populations down here in Lewis, west of Lewis. Um, down, if you go straight down, Barking tree frog, also in Lewis. Um, the big brown bat, which is everywhere in Delaware, but very rare nowadays. The fox squirrel, which you've probably heard of, Delmarva fox squirrel. And then up top, the only place in Delaware that this species is found is the corn snake in Cape Henlopen State Park. All these things need forest. The box turtle is not endangered, but it will be soon. It's declining very fast because of last of a loss of mature forest. This is an example, that barking tree frog I showed you. Well, you might say, well, what did a salamander and a frog need a forest for? 
Well, because they breed in these things. These are called Delmarva Bays. These are big bodies of water. And you have three beautiful ones down here west of Lewis and Jimtown area and a little bit south. They breed there. They lay their eggs young, grow the larvae, but the rest of their life, they live in the forest. And what's happening down here, and I don't want to point fingers, at three, those three ponds is they are protecting the ponds, but they're cutting down the forest. Not all of it in some cases. They are leaving a little bit here and there, which, you know, that's good, but it's not enough. Here's one of them. I'm not going to point say which one this is. For no, you know, it's not. A, it doesn't matter. But this it, this is a shot I took last, um, New Year's Day of a development going in, and you'll see that little line. The, the bare line is where the houses are, and then to the left is the buffer. It's only it's only 50 feet. That's about from here to there, and it was a forest. So. The animals that are in that pond are probably, um, I was telling my buddy, I said, this is going to be, if I live long enough, I'm going to have a kind of a case study of how to extirpate two species of endangered species right, right here in Sussex County. Um, luckily, in Delaware, those species do occur farther north near Middletown in Blackbird State Forest where they're protected. And some tiger salamanders live in Redden State Forest where they're protected. But otherwise, probably all the rest are going to slowly decline and, and probably go away. Um, I'm not going to talk about leaves too much. Leaves are, leaves are an interesting story, but leaves are very valuable to a forest. And they can be valuable even in your yard, and maybe not your front yard, but maybe the backyard if you could leave some leaves, because a lot of our, our insects actually overwinter in, in leaves. So I'm not going to tell you to, my dad would roll over in his grave if I was telling him not to rake his leaves but anyway next so what can we do very quickly up oh, uh, see how that, that, I had that all fixed so it was going to come on slow don't worry I'm kidding I'm kidding the left one we can protect the forests that are that are under state or county or local jurisdictions protect them they're for the people then we can help landowners protect tree, private landowners protect trees on their land. And we do that in a lot of ways. But the best way is incentivize them. Okay. First educate them, but then incentivize them. If you want, if we want, collectively, want Joe to not put houses in his forest, we have to compensate Joe. It's our, it's, you know, it's going to become part of What's why we want that forest there, not just for Joe or for the people that live there. So there has to be some more incentives, and we're working hard to try to figure that out. They can be tax incentives. They can be easement, easements on land. They can be outright buying the land. I believe the state should be buying more land, forest land, not, not so much just ag fields, but forest lands. Um, so anyway, there's different ways. And then protecting existing specimen trees, or even any tree, protect and maintain as best as you can. If you have one in your yard, take care of it. There's nothing wrong with that. And for a city like Lewis, take care of your trees. I know that, you know, I'm not talking about the politics of it all. That's for you to decide. <laughs> um, so education is important. So promote the value, it's like what I'm trying to do now, promote the value of native trees to wildlife. Encourage landowners to plant and maintain native trees and forests. To promote increased conservation on public and private lands. All this takes a sea change in our way we look at natural systems. Because we have to compensate these people for protecting this resource. Uh, I believe. Oh, well, there's one more. Oh, then work with, that's what you're doing today. Work with state, county, and local governments to conserve trees and forests. Um, I just want to say a word about planting trees because this is the you know latest thing and, and, and everybody's doing it. I'm doing it. I plant over 900 a year, usually 1,000 a year. Um, and this is great because this is trees for the future. We need to plant trees. I'll say a couple words. <laughs> um, you got to do it wisely, though. Number one, you have to plant trees in the right place. You got to plant the right trees in the right place. So even when you're doing big plantings like this, you have to know what you're doing. Um, you also have to plant them properly. And that's a huge problem. Also, you have to take care of those trees. And not just take care of them tomorrow. Take care of them five years sometimes, ten years. 
So you got to put, in other words, you have to put resources into planting trees. You just can't go out, get a bunch of trees, throw them in the ground, and expect them to grow. It's not going to happen. Um, this is just a shot of the way we, where I plant mainly is Middle Run Park in Newcastle County, north of Newark. Um, we, uh, I, if we just put the trees in the ground, if they didn't die because of drought, or well, first, if they didn't die because they were planting in property, they died because of drought. If they didn't die because of drought, they died because of deer ate them. If they didn't die because of deer ate them, they died because of deer rubbed them. If they didn't die from deer rubbing, they died from meadow voles eating them. It's one problem after another, but it's worth it. So we, ha we maintain these trees, we go in, and we really take care of them. Um, these are the things, if, if, if those things I just mentioned don't get them, these will. These are invasive plants. I don't know if you can see the left slide. There's a little thing sticking up. That's a tulip tree leaf. That's a tulip tree, about 25 feet, and it's covered with a plant called porcelain berry. Terrible plant. I hope you don't get it down here. It's getting here, though, unfortunately. Okay? Okay, last shot. Uh, so uh, I know not all of us are tree huggers. Um, my wife is. Uh, this is that chestnut tree that was mentioned. This is the largest chestnut tree that's been found in Delaware or even around Delaware for a long, long time. Um, it was a pretty neat find. Only one. <laughs> and that's, that's it. Um, I hope you have fun voting, but thank you. <laughs>